All right, so I see it's 1130. Uh, and if, if you look down at the participant number, it is slowly and quickly increasing, which is kind of exciting. So we are expecting a lot of people to join us today. And I'm not gonna steal Jovina's thunder, uh, but I am delighted that Professor McCormick is here with us. And uh, Jovina, who um, is going to introduce herself, will also be introducing Professor McCormick. So Jovina, why don't you, um, why don't you begin? Great. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Jovina Bashinsky, and I'm a second year doctoral nursing stu uh, doctoral student at the Queen's School of Nursing. And it is my distinct honor and pleasure to welcome you to this year's Jerry McEwen Memorial Lecture in Nursing. This memorial was established by Dr. Pete McEwen in memory of Jerry McEwen to bring speakers to Queen's School of Nursing on topics, including nursing education, research, scholarship, and clinical expertise, as well as innovation. Jerry McEwen, nay Hamilton, was born in Belleville, Ontario in 1950 and was raised in Peterborough, Ontario. She graduated from the Kingston General Hospital School of Nursing in 1971. She practiced nursing at both the Kingston General Hospital and the Wellesley Hospital in Toronto. Jerry married Pete McEwen in 1972. Pete himself is a 1973 graduate of Queen's Faculty of Medicine. Both Jerry and Pete settled in Ottawa in 1978, and for many years, she managed the, the business aspect of Pete's anesthesia practice at the ho Ottawa Hospital's um, Civic Campus. Jerry was an excellent wife, nurse, mother, and took pride in all three roles. She loved her family above all else, and she took great pleasure in her home, genealogy, gardening, and animals, and she believed strongly in the sanctity of all living creatures. Their son, Kenny, studied mechanical engineering at Queen's University. Unfortunately, in 20, 2018, Jerry passed away unexpectedly but peacefully at her home after a brief but devastating illness. And having lost the love of his life, Pete decided in consultation with Kenny to establish an endowed annual lecture in her memory at the Queen's School of Nursing. During his years as a medical student and anesthesia resident at Queens and his years of practice and teaching at Ottawa, Pete had always been inspired and motivated by visiting professors' lectures, and he wished to enable the same inspiration for Queens nursing students in Jerry's memory. As I noted earlier, I am in, in year two of my PhD journey at Queens School of Nursing. My research interest is in the palliative approach to care within the person-centered practice framework developed by doctors, by professors Brendan McCann, Brendan McCormack, my apologies, and Tanya McCanns. And I feel very, very privileged to be given the opportunity, opportunity to introduce Professor McCormack to you. Clearly, the academic stars have aligned for me today. I am especially excited to see this framework come to life in the next hour or so. In the meantime, I have immersed myself in this framework. It has served me, it has served a dual purpose in my life in being the theory underpinning my research pursuit, as well as philosophy in my clinical practice as a nurse practitioner. I just recently met Professor McCormack and I hope I do justice to, to my introduction. Uh, and, uh, and, and this is what I've learned thus far. So Professor McCormack is a registered nurse, holds a Bachelor of Science in Nursing degree from Buckinghamshire at New, New University and a Doctor of Philosophy degree from the University of Oxford. He is the head of, division, of the Division of Nursing, Occupational Therapy and Arts, Art Therapies and Associate Director of the Center for Person-Centered Practice Research at Queen Margaret University in Edinburgh, Scotland. Among his academic distinctions, and there are many, uh, he holds fellowships with the Royal College of Nursing, the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland and the American Academy of Nursing. He is an honorary consultant for Erskine Care Scotland. Professor McCormack also holds professional um, positions at universities all over the world, Ireland, Norway, Slovenia, South Africa, Austria, Denmark, and Australia. His research has specifically focused on person-centered practice and over a period of 22 years, he has developed models, theories, frameworks, and evaluation instruments that have been globally adopted in policy and practice. Additionally, he has led the implementation and evaluation of person-centered practices in a variety of clinical settings and in healthcare curricula. In particular, he has a particular expertise in gerontological nursing and the adoption of person-centered practices with older people. 
Professor McCormack will deliver the Jerry McEwen Memorial Lecture on the being and doing of person-centered research developing a programmatic approach. On behalf of the McEwen family and Queen's School of Nursing, please join me in extending a very warm Queen's welcome to Professor McCormack. Thank you. Thank you very much, Javina. Um, and that's a wonderful welcome. And, uh, and I'm really thrilled to be with you um, all uh, this afternoon for me, but this morning for, for you guys over there. Uh, but I also understand that we're joined by people from around the world, which is uh, fantastic uh, that to have such a collection of people coming together this afternoon, morning, evening, depending on where you are in the world. Um, I want to thank um, Dr. Snellgrove Clark, uh, Erna in particular, for uh, asking me to do this prestigious lecture and to the McEwen family for making it happen. It's really wonderful to see such a lecture happening and I feel very honored and privileged uh, to be asked uh, to do this particular lecture. Uh, my only regret is that I'm not there with you in person, uh, but I hope that can happen one day um, and it would, be, it would be lovely to come and, and meet you all in 3D, uh, which would be, would be fantastic. Um, we've got an hour and a half of time together and what I'd like to do is to um, speak for hopefully no, no more than an hour, um, I'm hoping slightly less, uh, and then to have some time for conversation and uh, I really like engaging with people, I really like the conversation part of these kind of events, um, so it would be wonderful to have that time. Um, in talking to Erin about what uh, I fo would focus on, um, then um, we agreed that I would focus more on a research perspective to do with uh, person-centered practice um, and person-centeredness um, and how over those 22 years that Javina has said, I've, uh, with many colleagues, uh, developed a programmatic approach to the work that I engage in. But in getting to that point, I do want to talk a little bit about why person-centeredness is important uh, to me and why it should be important to all of us uh, who work in healthcare or indeed in any organization. Uh, and I say that because a lot of my work has not just been in healthcare, but actually has very much been embedded in universities, uh, but also in, in what you, we might call social care, but those areas where people live outside of, of direct healthcare experiences, such as housing, communities, etc. Um, but also in the context of, of how we live our lives, I think it's, it's very, very important to think about it. I then want to say a bit about person-centeredness as a and personhood as a philosophy, just to put it all in context, before finally moving on to the research perspective in, in particular. So I hope uh, that there is enough uh, in that uh, to interest you, irrespective of the perspective that you, you might be coming from. So, um, person-centeredness uh, is very much established now as a, as a global movement. And I've been very privileged and uh, honored to have been part of that movement for uh, a long, long time. Um, I, I do, can talk a lot about my origins in this. I started off life as a mental health nurse in Ireland um, and uh, then moved on to being a, a registered uh, general nurse. Um, and have worked, as Javina has said, with older people and older people living with dementia, uh, mostly in community and residential settings for most, most of my career, uh, but have spent a long time in acute care work as well. Um, and uh, I became particularly interested in the notion of personhood and person-centeredness when doing my doctorate at Oxford, um, where I had a wonderful uh, supervisor who was an educator, but more significant, significantly, I guess, a moral philosopher who really shaped uh, my thinking about um, what it means to be a person uh, fun fundamentally. And, and that was quite a significant personal journey, um, as well as being a, an academic and professional one, in understanding uh, some of the things that um, distressed me about nursing and healthcare and about mental health nursing in particular when I, that I had experienced in the 80s. Uh, and how to make sense of those. And, and so began for me in 1997, uh, this uh, journey around person-centeredness and uh, understanding how uh, we can pay more attention to the humanity of persons uh, in, in our work. Uh, on this slide, 
uh, I've chosen to just put a, a variety of pictures together to illustrate just how global uh, this, this whole perspective is now. Uh, and in that period of time, it has become uh, something of a, of a movement that has been driven a lot by the work that we have engaged in where we were some of the very early work uh, alongside the work of Tom Kitwood in dementia care. Um, but uh, probably more recently in 2016, when the WHO um, published their report around framework, a framework for integrated people-centered health services, then the interest in person-centeredness as, as an idea and as a framework really took some momentum. So the last five years in particular, I think, has seen a, a huge growth uh, in person-centeredness underpinning philosophies, underpinning um, strategies for healthcare around the world uh, and very much informing the way healthcare is being redesigned. I just want to do a shameless plug for uh, the green colored book in the corner, uh, which is our most recent book that we've written specifically for uh, students in healthcare and newly registered practitioners. And it is due out next month. We're just waiting for it to land on our doorstep, so to speak. Um, and that brings together a whole collection of people who have been uh, working and writing in this field over the last 10 years. So it's, it's very exciting for us. But I do want to pick up a couple of points about why this is important. And I hope you can see the funny side of this chart as much as you see the, the uh, serious intention behind it. Um, one of the things that has always uh, interested me and, and distressed me about uh, the way healthcare happens is the influence of organizations. And so in the work that I've done around implementing research and practice, I have always been most interested in the context of practice, that is the settings where practice takes place. And in most of the organizations that we all work and, and whether we like it or not, uh, many of us spend most of our lives in organizations, stroke institutions. Um, and there is a reified idea about how organizations work. And we're all probably quite familiar with the very well organized organizational chart that uh, di dictates the hierarchy depicts the hierarchy and shows the relationships between them. But in reality, for most of us, organizations are incredibly messy, complex places that despite the organizational structures and processes and hierarchies are fundamentally about relationships and are fundamentally about the way people engage with each other um, and how we connect with each other and the way we communicate and relate with each other. And hence why I think this chart really, really interests me and excites me because of course what it does is get, gets underneath uh, many of the issues that on a day-to-day -day basis kind of either help us to have effective relationships or stop us from having effective relationships because there are all of these complex relational based things going on that often don't get spoken about or if they do it's often uh, in angst or um, in secret so they're they kind of just sit behind uh, the overt communication that people might have and the overt decisions that people might engage in um, so I hope you've had time to see some of those um, some not so discreet <laughs> relationships that are happening and they are happening in all our organizations all of the time and the importance of that is because it it highlights the significance of relationships and the way that we connect with each other and building on that idea um one of the things that is absolutely critical to effective relationships in our healthcare systems um, is this idea of psychological safety and I became particularly interested in this as an idea and as a concept uh, in work that I was doing in Northern Ireland when I was then a professor of nursing, but deputy director of nursing in the Royal Hospitals in Belfast, which is a very large trauma centre, where I was supervising the work of the um, head of the acute pain services, uh, Dr. Donna Brown, uh, which be and eventually became her PhD work. And we were looking at um, the uh, post-operative pain management of older people uh, with who had colorectal surgery um, and why it was that despite all of the evidence and uh, all of the tools and processes and training and education that existed, we still had really poor quality pain management practices. Um, and uh, it's a very complex study and it has been published. Um, there's two or three papers that really set out the whole study. But one of the key findings from that study was this idea of psychological safety. And psychological safety comes from the feminist literature and it 
um, is an idea that um, in order to be ourselves, in order to be authentic, we have to feel psychologically safe. And what's interesting about this idea is that um, it connects with a real focus of our work in person-centeredness around effective workplace cultures. That, for example, we can have all of the evidence in the world, but if our workplace <clears throat> is not a healthy workplace culture where people feel psychologically safe, then that evidence will never make its way into practice. And that was one of the key findings in this study as to why it was that people were not uh, using the evidence they should do and engaging in effective pain management practices. And we identified three core concepts within that. One was about insufficient support. Uh, the second was about oppressive behaviors and the way uh, people engage in oppressing other people. Um, and we saw that at all levels and within teams and between teams. Um, and where there is weak leadership, that is where the leadership is frankly not person-centered, but is more transactional in the way that it, that it engages. And so we have very much in our work, uh, really from the outset, because of this interest in context and why it is that even the best of practitioners somehow get lost in the system, um, that it's to do with the way organizations function, the way the teams function, and the way that the systems connect with each other uh, in those contexts, focusing on relationships. And so that brings us to the idea of persons and personhood. And um, the idea of personhood is an incredibly complex uh, philosophical idea, and there's multiple philosophies, and most of them from the West, but increasingly we are seeing some very interesting ideas coming from Eastern philosophies and Aboriginal communities around the idea of persons and personhood. And my work in South Africa has been really interesting in, in that respect around how the view of the person differs so significantly uh, from how we might view that uh, in the West. But fundamentally, personhood uh, represents the core of who I am as a person. It represents my values. Um, what people often might refer to as it represents self. Um, I don't say the word the self or the self because self is multiple and we have multiple selves. But there is a core connection within us that represents who I am as that individual person. If you have a religious belief, that may often be represented by the idea of the soul and how the soul shapes the way I live my life. Um, so personhood is that kind of inner, inner being. And so what it really is, is highlighting is that essentially we are more than our body parts, that as persons, um, it's not just about our bone structure and the tissues and muscles that hold us together, but actually we are much more than that. And of course, in healthcare, this is such an important issue because so often uh, people feel like they are, are just a thing that is being, is being treated rather than this, this whole person. And the philosopher uh, Leipzig argues that our personhood is shaped by our interior and exterior conditions. And again, what this focuses on is the um, exterior conditions, the context, the cultures in which we live for our lives. So our interior conditions of our beliefs and our values and our desires uh, and our motivations and our attitudes and all of those things that we cannot see but are fundamentally a huge part of who I am as a person. But no matter how refined they might be for me or no matter how clear I might be about those values, etc., if the external conditions are not conducive to me living those conditions, then of course my personhood is impacted upon. Um, and hence, going back to, again, why team effectiveness, team relationships, et cetera, are so important. But we can extend this idea to um, how we live our lives more generally with our families and our friends and our partners uh, and the way those contexts shape uh, my personhood and my ability to live by my core values. In our work, um, uh, Javina has said about the work that we have, we have done, and we have very much been very focused on a philosophical approach to person-centeredness, and not just about the doing, but mostly about the being of person-centeredness and this idea of personhood. 
And um, this work that I'm showing on this slide actually shapes all of the work we do at Queen Margaret University in relation to our curricula and our research, which I'll be talking a bit about later, um, and, and how we try to engage also as a faculty and the work we've been doing as a faculty uh, to have a person-centered culture within our division of nursing and occupational therapy. And what we argue here is that uh, persons and personhood is not a fixed thing, it's not a fixed reality, but that we are constantly in this state of transition, we are in a state of being, knowing and becoming. And paying attention to our being shapes our knowing and our knowing shapes our becoming, which reinforms our being and we keep going around with our, our heads spinning, frankly. Um, but what we have um, focused on is that um, as a person, uh, I live in five modes of being and that those modes of being are constantly shaping and influencing how I live my life, how I make decisions, how I connect, how I engage, etc. And so the idea of reflexive engagement becomes so important uh, in constantly thinking through how it is that I'm connecting with others uh, and then reshaping um, further connections. Sorry, that moved on on its own for some bizarre reason. Um, so we have identified five modes of being, and you can read more about those in a, in a number of our publications that are here, and which I can certainly send further details on. Being in time um, represents the fact, uh, which comes from the work of Jan Dewing and her work in dementia, which argues essentially we're all time travelers. And, uh, and I guess in this current era we're living in where we're constantly uh, traveling around the world virtually, then uh, it, it's, it's very important at the moment. But this idea that uh, we're, we don't exist in a fixed state of time, that we may be you know, right now at a particular uh, point in the clock time, but actually we may be in a completely different place metaphorically or metaphysically, and that's important to recognize. Being with self is being comfortable with who I am as a person, my values and what I'm about. Um, and again, in our nursing curriculum at Queen Margaret's, our whole of our first year is focused on self and helping student nurses to um, be, become confident and clear about who they are as a person, um, as a basis for practice. Being in relation recognizes the significance of relationships, as I've just said, and we are all naturally uh, meant to be in relationships. And again, COVID-19 has really highlighted just how important relationships are to all of us um, and what isolation has done to some people in terms of impact on their mental health, etc. Being in the social world recognizes that to be healthy, we exist in, our, in a social state, um, which of course informs our work because we believe very strongly in a social model of health. Um, that our main reason for being healthy uh, and maintaining our health is for social engagement, whatever that might mean to us. And being in place recognizes the significance of both physical and metaphorical space and place. Um, and if you, if you ask anybody to do meditation or any of those things, then of course people will go to their favorite place, be that a beach or a woods or a forest or their living room, uh, you know, Friday evening with a gin and tonic in my hand is probably the one I most likely go to. Um, those kind of things are places that make us feel whole as a person. So what I'm arguing and what I'm showing here is that personhood is made up of these states of being and that that's what keeps us uh, whole as a person. And so when we think about practice and about patient care, for example, then we need to be thinking about patients also in these five modes of being and how are we paying, paying attention to it. But equally in our, in our relationships as colleagues, how are we paying attention to these states of being of each other uh, in order to ensure our health? And so, as Javina said, we have tried to bring all of that together into the person-centered practice framework, which I'm, I'm not going to have time to go into in any great depth um, because it's, it's, it's incredibly complex as a, as a theory. So it has been recognized as a theory and we're really extremely delighted about that. Um, and it's been used to inform a lot of curriculum work, which I'll say a little bit about later, used in research, but used in strategy and policy frameworks for health around the world. Um, we know it's been translated into about 11 languages at this point in time, but that is constantly changing. Um, and a lot of work has been done to develop tools, processes and methods for evaluating uh, person-centeredness. At the heart of our framework is this idea of a healthful culture. 
Um, healthfulness is a, a moral perspective on what it means to be healthy. Um, it comes from the work of David Seedhouse, who's an ethicist, um, who argues essentially that um, being healthy means maximizing my potential as a person. That no matter how disabled I might be or whatever illness I might have, if I still have the capacity to maximize my potential as a person, then I'm, I am healthy. And I was drawn to that idea way back uh, in uh, about 1994, actually, I think, when I was heading up a rehabilitation unit for older people in Oxford, just as I was starting my, my doctorate. And, um, and I remember very clearly looking after a woman um, who had locked in syndrome after a stroke, um, who really could only communicate with us through her eyes, through her eye movement. That was the only real, real physical ability she had. And um, because of the way we practiced, which was very much a person-centered approach, um, we were able to really engage with her and do person-centered planning with her by getting to know her through her eyes. Um, we were able to determine when she wanted to get up, um, how she, she wanted to be, how she wanted her day to be, um, through a series of, of cues that we learned to work with through her eyes. And so for us, she was living a healthful life, even though she was um, in a, this horrid locked down uh, kind of state. Um, and so healthfulness enables us to kind of see beyond the physical, see beyond this, this idea of, of um, we're just connected to our biological state, but that actually we, we, within us, no matter how disabled we can be or how, yeah, how disabled we are, that we, we can still maximize our potential. And so that is the core outcome from our person-centered work always is looking at the development of healthfulness in pe people or the development of healthfulness within cultures. And um, the framework works from the outside in, in the sense that you have that macro context of health strategy and policy, et cetera. The next circle in is the attributes of the practitioner. Uh, that um, whole domain is about who am I as a, as a practitioner and the qualities and skills and attributes I need to have in order to be an effective person-centered practitioner. The next um, uh, domain is the practice environment or the context. And I've said a lot about the way that influences. And then we get to what are often referred to as the petals of the flower, uh, which are the five practice domains, the, the person-centered processes that we engage in, uh, in relationships with colleagues, but often more significantly relationships with patients. And so in many respects, that's the person-centered care component of our framework. But it's deliberately designed like this um, with each of these solid circles, because I want to emphasize that because people often isolate person-centered care as the main thing to think about in practice. But actually, as you can see from this framework, you can't get at that person-centered care unless you pay attention to these other domains. Um, we, we have to pay attention to the context in which I'm practicing as a nurse. We have to pay attention to the competence and attributes that I need to be able to uh, engage in these, in these processes. Um, um, and to get at them, we have to pay attention to how all of these things work within any care setting or in any team. It's a really important message about all of that. But what we are very clear about in our work is that there is a lack of conceptual clarity about person-centeredness. Um, Ingela Ram Halberg, who's a very famous nurse researcher from Sweden, uh, recently uh, did an editorial in a, a, a Scandinavian nursing journal arguing that this is the biggest problem we have with person-centered healthcare at the moment is the lack of conceptual clarity. And I'll come back to that again a bit later. Um, and she identified that there have been over 120-ish, um, maybe more than that, reviews associating with person-centeredness and very few actually clearly define what they mean uh, and, uh, and use the, the, the phrase in quite a glib and unclarified way. So I would argue very strongly that if you are thinking about person-centeredness, you need to be very clear about how you define it and what you're actually talking about in relation to it. And so person-centered culture for us is a, a culture that enables effective engagement based on the formation and fostering of these healthful relationships. So these are relationships that nurture us as persons rather than drain us. 
And if we think about nursing practice and healthcare practice generally, this is possibly the biggest challenge we have. Uh, how teams uh, relate to each other, how they support each other, how they communicate with each other. Um, we know that burnout is a huge issue in nursing. Uh, we know that uh, bullying in nursing is a huge problem. Um, that the whole psychological safety issue is a huge problem in nursing. Um, and so this area of, of developing healthful relationships and person-centered cultures is really critical, I believe, for us to be able to move on with some of the person-centered work that is required and necessary in our healthcare systems. Um, it has got very clear values underpinning it, which are, are stated here, but it also is not something we can take for granted. It's something that needs to be continuously developed uh, both at an individual, a group, community and societal levels. Um, and I'll say something more about that a bit later. So person-centered culture is really critical to all of this. As I said, the outcome for this work is helpful culture, um, helpful relationships, these nurturing relationships. And in our work, we, as I said, we have developed a lot of instruments, tools and processes so that we can try and, and measure and evaluate the existence of person-centeredness in different teams and organizations and how close it might be getting to a healthful culture. So we've developed the person-centered practice inventory, which has got staff, patient and family and student um, um, versions of it. We've developed a systematic approach to observing practice. Uh, we use a lot of narratives and stories. So uh, we have a process for doing narrative-based work uh, in settings. Um, Tanya McCants, in particular, has led a, a program of work developing key performance indicators in person-centered practice, so five key performance indicators. And we also use routine data, such as falls and pressure damage prevention and those kind of things uh, to see how all of this connects. And that has been, those five areas of work have been a big focus of the, the more practical research that we've been engaged in over the last years. So moving on to the research, I guess for me, um, doing all of that theoretical work and uh, really doing a lot of work to develop different cultures and trying to get cultures more person-centered, my passion has been as uh, these public health nurses, nursing students um, uh, created with me one day, the idea of leaving a person-centered imprint. And I guess it's a reflective question I would want all of you to have as we go through this, this evening is, what is the imprint you want to leave as a nurse? What is the imprint you want to leave as a nurse leader or as a manager um, and that you want to be known for? Um, and I believe those imprints should be person-centered in whatever we, we are doing. Um, and, um, and I think it's such an important thing to think about is uh, what way do we want to leave, leave the world? What's the imprint we want to leave behind? And so the person Center practice research at Queen Margaret University has been a place where we have been trying to create that imprint locally, nationally and globally. And this is the front page of our website with a picture of Professor Jan Dewing, who is the director and I'm the co-director of it. Uh, and it's very easy to access if you go online to cpcpr.org, uh, you go directly to it. Um, so and it's all pretty open. Um, and there's also a free downloadable uh, book on uh, creativity and healthcare practice and research on there as well that you can, you can access. But I said earlier about the problem of definition and going back to Ingela Luam Hallberg's work, um, in research, we have a lot of research now that is claiming to be person-centered. Um, and um, a lot of that research in the reviews that we have done, that she has done, and that others have done, have shown that it really lacks definition. In many of these studies, they may be labelled as person-centred, may have that in an abstract or an introduction, and that's really the last one sees of it. Um, and that is a huge problem for this field and, uh, and something we are really trying to challenge quite, quite explicitly. Um, we also see, as I have said, where there's a lot of work looking specifically at say, person centered care, but not taking into account that wider context. So isolating care as being more important than everything else. And we have always argued that um, how person centered values um, are represented for staff is equally important to how they are represented for patients and that without them represented for staff, we cannot have, ever have person-centered care for patients. So we cannot isolate it 
as something that's more important than everything else. So we really have a lot of work to do still in ensuring that we have clarity of definition. There are um, a lot of um, research studies that are being published that are, are underpinned by person-centered concepts and theories. Um, but the other problem in doing person-centered research is that whilst they may be underpinned by a concept or a theory that is person-centered, we then see the application of methods and the engagement in research that is anything but person-centered. And so our drive in the center at Queen Margaret's has been to um, not just do person-centered research, but to do person-centered research in a person-centered way. Um, and that is a bigger challenge than one might think uh, in trying to do that. And, and we've been very committed to it. And it has meant really extending uh, the way we might view traditional methodological and theoretical ideas. And, uh, and the image on this slide is the person-centered research book that um, I was the co or the, the lead editor and author for with colleagues from other places in Europe uh, where I'm working and where person-centered research is, is happening. So I want to reinforce this idea that when establishing a program of research in person-centeredness, it's not just about doing research about person-centeredness, but it's also our commitment to doing that research in a person-centered way. Um, and morally, that is a, a really important principle. But it doesn't mean to say that our, our research is so different. Um, we would see this as the yes and of person-centered research. So yes, the particular methodologies, but what is it that the person-centered perspective brings to that? And so uh, what I would argue, and again, we've written about this in, in that book, um, is that there are um, probably seven or so key ideas that um, shape person-centered research. One is the ontological and epistemological pillars on which person-centered research is pitched, which is fundamentally going back to the modes of being, who am I as a person in this research? So when I'm examining doctoral studies, for example, that, uh, are, that claim to be doing person-centered research, if I don't see a thorough analysis of the researcher as person, then I'm immediately doubting uh, whether this is person-centered research or not. And this is something we might want to talk a bit more about. Um, it also requires us to be methodological pluralistic. Um, we cannot do person-centered research and pay, pay attention to all the dimensions of persons by just applying one methodology. And so in our work at the center with our doctoral candidates, uh, we have about 30 doctoral candidates in person-centered research center. Um, all of them would be doing uh, pluralistic methodologies. And we do that by um, not requiring our candidates to sign up to a particular methodology, but to start at the level of ontology and epistemology and to develop principles that underpin their research. So we would see very few studies coming out of our center, for example, that might claim to be phenomenological or based on grounded theory or something like that. Um, they would draw together a collection of philosophical principles that will shape the way they engage that research. Um, and they may connect them with some established methodological perspectives, but it won't be exclusive in that, in that respect. We also expect to see questions that capture the humanity of persons. And so even if um, a student might be doing something as a randomized controlled trial, we would still expect to see something within those research questions that extend the humanity of persons. And um, in the program where I have been teaching on a PhD program up until this year at the University of Southeastern Norway uh, in Norway, um, this has been a key part of the person-centered PhD program there, uh, where even people who are doing experimental designs, uh, we expect them to build in some uh, questions um, that uh, connect the humanity of persons. And that's been really interesting uh, to watch as uh, some people who are doing bench science, uh, but are also thinking about how this connects to persons and it really changes the nature of that research. We also expect to see an engagement framework that uh, promotes safety, openness and trust. And in your world, this might mean something around um, a patient and public involvement, as it's often referred to, but it's about being transparent in, in what we're doing. It's about facilitating autonomy, participation and collaboration across researchers and um, 
patients and others who are engaged in the research. And fundamentally, it's about being authentic. It's about trying to do research that is authentic, where the authenticity of the researcher is made explicit and the authenticity of the research is also made explicit um, so that we can engage uh, in communicative spaces where we can have dialogue uh, and understand and deepen our understanding of what is happening in these studies. So um, these are really very, very important principles that underpin person-centered research and that really are the extension of what person-centeredness brings to our research program. It makes it more complex, of course, and that is a big issue in itself. In that context, I do want to say a little bit about person-centered practice versus evidence-based practice. And we could do the whole talk on this, um, and, uh, and it may be also a, a controversial thing to talk about. And certainly I know in North America, um, the evidence-based practice movement dominates. Um, and I've had many of the interesting uh, debate stroke fight uh, about this with uh, North American colleagues uh, in, the, in relation to the impact of evidence-based practice on nursing knowledge uh, and nursing science. And, uh, and in many ways, how we've lost uh, so much in nursing by focusing on this more generic evidence-based route. And again, I just want to highlight here uh, what differentiates being person-centered in practice from following an evidence-based practice uh, route. And uh, I'm not going to go through each of these points, but I, I guess um, I would best illustrate it from my practice, um, which I still engage in uh, with people living with dementia in nursing homes. And again, we have seen this play out uh, in the COVID pandemic in, in quite serious and detrimental ways. Um, I have been very disturbed by what I've seen and I'm still experiencing during the COVID period. Uh, about the way older people and people with dementia in nursing homes are, are treated and managed. Um, and it comes from an evidence-based based perspective, which is essentially there is a one size fits all. And that is often to do with infection control practices that have been imported from acute care settings um, and assumed that they will work within a nursing home setting. Um, and, and of course, that is not the case. And, we have seen many problems with this to do with infection control, uh, to do with visiting of family members, to do with touch in nursing homes, to do with isolation, and a whole array of other practices that um, essentially really highlight and bring into sharp focus uh, why evidence-based practice on its own is not enough uh, if we are going to talk about person-centered practice. And that has been a huge motivator in my work for the last 30 years, really, uh, is to um, how do we actually work in a way that's person-centered and individual rather than just trying to uh, work with everything that is, is based on um, kind of synthesized evidence. And so we, there is a huge issue here. And again, something that we play out a lot within our center and our research program. So the person-centered practice research center is about doing research that humanizes healthcare, um, and that's a big drive for what we do about developing methodologies and uh, extending, extending methodologies, trying to influence the way person-centered practices are viewed around the world, and trying to fundamentally enhance people's experience of care and well-being uh, and making a difference in their lives. We have four research pillars, which are particularly obvious. Um, and I also want to highlight the logo that's on here, which is the Person-Centered Practice International Community of Practice. And this is a community of practice that we have developed from the center. Uh, and currently we have partners all over the world. Um, and uh, we have a formal agreement about how we work together. And, uh, and if any of you are interested in joining us, uh, we are very open to you uh, joining in. We have both associate membership, which is for individuals, uh, and full membership, which is for departments, organizations who are committed to a person-centered uh, practice of various kinds. And we have an application process um, and we have a program of work. So if you are interested, please, please get in touch, touch with me. Our program really has um, focused on these kind of six broad, broad areas. Um, so we do some work in care and treatment interventions. Um, so largely focused on person-centered care, I guess, within that, that work. Uh, as Javina said in introducing me, we have done a lot of work around frameworks um, and developing the person-centered practice framework and testing it in practice. 
Uh, as Erna will know, uh, a lot of my own work has very much focused on implementation studies uh, and uh, using participatory uh, and creative methods for doing implementation science. Um, we have developed instruments and tools for evaluation, as well as the theoretical work, and probably more recently getting really focused on outcome measurement. And we are um, working closely with the Swedish Centre for Person-Centred Care, who are now members of our community of practice, uh, in looking at how we bring together our instruments and their instruments for measuring interventions uh, to see can we develop a more uh, kind of broader perspective and broader package of measurement tools that will focus both on care and culture at the same same time. I just want to highlight some examples of that work um, because one of the things that we are very committed to is the education of future person-centered practitioners and um, in 2018 we brought out the position statement on person-centeredness in health and social care curricula and this has been published also in the International Practice Development Journal um, and this is because uh, uh, one of my doctoral candidates who's just finishing her work um, has been focusing on person-centeredness in the curriculum and again in a review of international curricula we identified very few that are actually person-centered. Uh, they may have a person-centered module or a course or a unit but that is very um, limited in what it actually offers. So if we are expecting healthcare practitioners to be person-centered then we need curricula that actually um, help educate them to understand what it is about. That work has resulted in a large project that we're currently in the middle of, um, funded by the European Union, which is and the Erasmus Plus scheme. Um, and it's a collaboration between ourselves, Ulster University, Trinity, well, it was UCD, it's now Trinity College in Dublin, Fontes University of Applied Sciences in the Netherlands, University of Southeastern Norway, and University of Maribor in Slovenia, uh, where we are aiming to develop the first person-centered in healthcare curriculum framework in Europe, uh, but that will also have international relevance. The first three outputs from that project have just been published in a special issue of the International Practice Development Journal, and these are freely available if you go online to this site, uh, they can all be downloaded for free. So we've produced a, a meta-synthesis of person-centeredness in nursing curricula, uh, we've done a, a global review of developments in person-centered healthcare, which builds on the earlier work I did in 2017. Um, and we have uh, published the first uh, philosophical and pedagogical principles for person-centered curricula, which in themselves help to inform uh, how we might educate uh, future uh, practitioners. So these are really starting to um, take shape. And at the moment, what we're now doing is trying to um, bring those principles and pedagogical ideas together into a, a synthesized curriculum framework that can be applied across all healthcare subjects. And that's our intention. Some other uh, of our focus, our center, we have been very focused on capacity and capability building. And I guess that's one of the reasons why I hold so many positions around the world because I'm very committed and driven by building future generations of researchers. And these are some examples of the doctoral work that um, has been completed. Um, as I said, uh, I've now supervised 28 doctorates to completion, um, and we currently have about 30 uh, in the centre that majority of whom Jan Dewing and I supervise with many other um, multidisciplinary team members, um, all of whom are researching aspects of person-centeredness and doing it in a person-centered way. So extending methodologies, etc., in that way. But, you know, our work in these doctorates crosses all of those original areas I showed around from imp implementation science to evaluating interventions uh, to instruments, etc., and also developing a lot of methodologies. So uh, in this list, you will see the project titled uh, Bad News from Theatre, which is a particular project uh, working with a drama practitioner exploring the idea of developing sympathetic presence in student nurses. So how do we help student nurses to develop this quality of being sympathetically present? Uh, and we're doing that through drama. Um, and that work's just about to come to an end, actually, very excitingly. 
But we've also um, taken a programmatic approach to how we, we build our research program, uh, which as I said, is, is really global in the way that we're doing it um, and covers and crosses all specialties and all areas. Um, so these are examples again of the kind of work uh, that we are connected with. And um, these are very multidisciplinary, um, are not nursing exclusive at all, um, are, are very interdisciplinary in the way that they're delivered um, and across all specialties in, in health and social care. But the one I want to spend a little bit of time on is the BOLD programme, which is one I'm currently um, the co-leader of. And this programme excites me because it kind of extends our thinking about nursing and healthcare and how we engage. Um, it's a project um, or programme that is funded by a charitable organisation called Life Changes Trust um, that has a particular focus on um, enhancing the lives of persons living with dementia, but also enhancing the lives of young people, particularly young people um, who have care experience. Um, it's jointly delivered by us at Queen Margaret's and uh, colleagues at the University of Edinburgh. And the idea of this programme is, is very exciting for me. Um, and what it, because what it's focusing on is developing leadership qualities among uh, persons who are living with dementia. And um, so BOLD stands for bringing out leaders in dementia. Um, and uh, we're delighted with that idea because what we're not doing is like I guess many of us might have experienced is going on a leadership course and then I'm a leader, uh, but actually bringing out those qualities, the interior parts of the person and how do we enhance those so that they can change their own lives and change the lives of others who are living with dementia. Um, it's focused on the idea of flourishing and human flourishing. Um, and one of the other things we've done on this program is to be very explicit about getting away from some of the symbolism of dementia, which often is around handholding and all other kind of disabled figures. And instead, we have gone for very bright, bold, alternative views of the world uh, to um, really challenge uh, in everything we're doing, the way people view pe persons living with dementia in our society. I should have said that uh, the project program is over five years and we have uh, about three million pounds of funding uh, to deliver that alongside um, another strand of work that's integrated. So our, our vision for this work is to come to this idea that having dementia doesn't matter for who, who I am as a person or how I live my life. Going back to that original idea that I said at the first place that it's not about the kind of superficial body as to who I am. Uh, so dementia actually shouldn't change how we view anyone. It's that deeper personhood that we try and hang on to and try and ensure that they can continue to maximize their potential as persons in society. We are starting with the experts and the experts as this slide suggests exist everywhere in Scotland. Um, it's not about choosing people in formal leadership positions, but our participants are people from all walks of life with dementia, carers of people living with dementia, people who are advocates and community workers, and everybody who is trying to make life more fulfilling for persons with dementia in our society. We are using the theory of human flourishing, which I've done quite a bit of work on, um, to try and create the conditions uh, in society for persons with dementia to feel safe, to be listened to, to be valued, to be respected as a person, uh, but also to be able to change, grow and develop. One of the really distressing things about the language of dementia is the way we, we kind of forget the personhood behind it that we talk about persons with dementia in quite limiting uh, and debilitating ways, rather than about them as full persons who have capabilities and capacities and the ability to change and grow and develop. Um, you know, as I kind of sometimes say, dementia is one of the greatest gifts we can have because we can be as bad as we like uh, as a person with dementia and get away with it. Um, we can be a totally different person from the one I am now. Uh, we can strip away some of those attributes and, and be a different kind of being. And why not? We know that is a possibility. And our practice should enable the person to be the person they want to be. We're using a model of social leadership 
um, to do that. Uh, comes from the work of a social informer, social leader called Julian Stodd, who again, if you want to read his work, he's a prolific writer. But social leadership is about our humility and our willingness to learn and share and connect with others. So it takes all of those things I've talked about, about relationships and what gets in the way of organizations and, uh, and turns it all on its head because it's all about action, about creativity, about having fun and fundamentally about relationships. We have four core values that have, were actually devised by our first cohort of participants. And that is that our work, in our work and in our engagement with our participants, we're doing four things. We're showing love, we're showing character, being creative and being bold. And that is what we're trying to do in this work. So I wanted to use the BOLD program to illustrate how we take uh, these values and these principles underpinning person-centeredness and personhood and try and weave them into everything that we're doing. I, I could talk a lot more about the complexity of this work and the methodologies of evaluation that are embedded in it to try and hold all of this together. And so to come to a conclusion. Um, I believe it's a, it's a passion of mine that everyone has the right to flourish, that nobody should be languishing as Aristotle argued. Aristotle argued that the opposite of flourishing is languishing and that languishing is essentially a state worse than death. And my concern is that in many of our clinical areas and in many of our university settings and other places, people are languishing, that they're not motivated by the work, they feel burned out, uh, they feel distressed, um, you know, they, they're not bothered about coming back to work. It's, it's just something they do almost wrote like. They're not doing anything bad. They're just not flourishing in that space. And we have a moral duty as formal leaders and as researchers and educators to actually not accept that as an acceptable way of being. And the Danish philosopher Lukestrup, uh, who uh, again has really influenced some of my thinking, um, argues that um, by our very attitude to the other person, we can reshape their world. Um, the way we connect with them, the way we, we engage with them, we can make their world either huge or we can make it very drab and dull and threatening. And I believe that that's a choice that every person has and that every person in healthcare has a duty uh, to engage in, in order to ensure that uh, we create these flourishing, healthful communities. And finally, I will end with, with this uh, quote. I don't know if any of you have read, but you really should. This wonderful book called The Boy, the Mole, the Fox and the Horse. It's a very simple, beautifully illustrated book, full of wonderful philosophical statements. And one of them is this one, which is, I wonder if there is a school of unlearning. And one of the biggest challenges we have in person-centered work is helping people to unlearn what they think they know about person-centered practice and, and being a person-centered practitioner. So much of our work gets stifled by people saying, yes, I'm person-centered, of course I am. Uh, and that's where it ends. So we have to really take off those, those masks uh, and, uh, and unlearn those things that we may think are dear to us um, to relearn uh, and transform into being person-centered practitioners. Thank you. Okay, no Fabulous. Thank you so much, Brendan. So, um, I, you know, it's so hard in this world of uh, virtualness to be able to acknowledge a, a guest speaker. So for a quick moment, I'm going to ask everybody to unmute themselves and just give a quick little, or put your camera on. And let's just give Brendan a quick little round of applause. Uh, awesome. Thank you. Thanks. That's great. So, Brendan, um, wow. You know, I've, guys, I've known Brendan uh, for quite a few years, uh, and he's taught me quite a lot. And if you can capture some of the essence of his presentation, his desire for all persons to flourish, to truly understand their personhood and unlearn, has been the pleasure of having a colleague and a very dear friend who supports me and challenges me in the same breath, and that's a gift. And if we can take that and move that forward, we've done exceptionally well. Brendan, you've uh, given everybody some food for thought. Um, and I know there may be a variety of questions that are percolating for people. I, I asked, not everybody may be looking at their chat, but I asked uh, people during your presentation if they wanted to share some thoughts. I've captured them on a, a Word document, 
Um, and I can start with some of, the, some of those questions, but what I will promise to get to do with uh, Brendan's uh, agreement is the questions that we don't get to, because I will do them in order. Uh, the questions that we don't get to, we can, uh, I will, I'll send them to Brendan and uh, ask him to give me a response and I'll get them out to you so that people can have their questions answered. We've got a, a short period of time to, to get through some things. So are you, are you ready for uh, rounds of questioning, Professor McCormick? I'm ready. Awesome. So uh, the first question actually surprise is from Jovina. And uh, Jovina asked, how do we address moral distress and burnout for individuals who are promoting person-centered care, but are facing roadblocks? Where in this framework can we re-enter to rejuvenate ourselves? Mm. Brilliant question, and probably will take uh, another five hours to properly, properly answer. Um, and I guess where I would, what I, what I hear is the emphasis on person-centered care. Um, and going back to what I said, that when we just focus on the idea of person-centered care, if you, could, if you think about the framework, we are right into that petals part, the doing part. Um, and of course, that is where the burnout really takes place because that is where the intensity of the relationship is at its highest. So where we have to, what we have to do is a bit like the quality argument is go back upstream and back upstream is into the context, is into that care environment component. So the moral distress issue for me is, is, a, is a, a manifestation of ineffective workplace cultures. Um, it's a manifestation of poor team cultures, of non-healthful environments, environments where people are languishing and allowed to languish, um, and where there isn't there's that lack of a psychologically safe environment. And so um, I think what we have to do, and what I think, well, I think what the wrong thing to do, which is often what happens, is people are either taken out of those environments or they go off sick and uh, et cetera. Um, but I think what we have to do is not remove people from those environments, but have leaders who are willing to engage in a different kind of conversation with people in those environments. Um, I believe really strongly that there is no such thing as a bad nurse. And I'm saying that on a day when we've just had uh, a news story about a nurse in the UK who's being charged with murdering eight infants in a hospital and possibly have, has murdered up to about 30. Um, uh, but I think they are extreme and often psychopathic or, or Munchausen by proxy type conditions rather than this person set out to be a nurse to murder kids. I don't think that's ever the case. What I do think happens is that people get lost in the system and that the context um, actually burns them out and that context kind of loses that. And our job as leaders is to refine that button. Um, and I could give... At the moment, actually, because uh, I lead a team of about 60 academics and administrators, and I could give an example, two examples, actually, of two team members who were sent to me from other parts of the university in administration roles because they were, quote, failing. Um, and those two people are key people in our team purely because of the kind of culture which they are now engaged in. In reality, there's some mental health issues, et cetera, but we've been able to really deal with those and work with those as, as persons. And it, it just shape, reshapes that world. And um, it is a leadership responsibility, fundamentally. Mm. Awesome. Thank you, Brendan. Um, I'm not gonna spend time revisiting your response just because there's so many questions and I'd love to get through them. Um, our colleague Danielle uh, has brought with uh, to this presentation today um, students from our philosophy and healthcare course, and these are first year nursing students. And Danielle is wondering what advice do you have specifically for them as they begin their journey in nursing? Ooh, oh gosh, <laughs> this is the stuff that really excites me because um, uh, you know the potential is so enormous. Um, so I guess the advice I would, I would really give is to be really clear about your sphere of influence. Um, so, you know, that whole idea of um, what it is that I can really pay attention to and focus on and build on is so critical at this point as first year students and, and the whole way through. Um, so many students get uh, burnt out very quickly or very disillusioned very quickly because of course that idealism and that passion to change things and to be the perfect nurse etc of course it's there 
Um, and our role as educators is to nurture that and hold that. And um, as a, in work we've done around hope, um, one of our roles is, is holders of hope, to be that holder of that person's hopefulness. And what I would say to every student is not to lose hope. Um, mm -hmm. What you have to do is engage in another conversation or a different kind of conversation. And our role as an as a educator and academic is to hold that hope, not to distinguish or extinguish that hope, uh, not to kind of uh, put people in boxes and expect them to be there, but to actually really keep people open and flourishing. And, um, and if you're not as a student in that kind of environment, then you really should be asking for it and requiring it and expecting it within your program. But don't leave. Don't think the easy way is to walk away from it because that's not the easy way. Um, but to actually really take it on, but in a way that you can influence and hold. Um, so there's a dual responsibility in all of that for me. And lots of work. And a massive amount of work. <laughs> So if we think about work, one of the other questions from our colleague Daniel is around uh, influencing policy. And Daniel wondered, Brenda, did you have any examples of person-centered research being used successfully to influence policy and where evidence-based practice might usually hold most influence? Is this Daniel Wollstonehome? Sure it is. Oh. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so some of my own work um, in Malaysia, for example, uh, so I worked through WHO with the Ministry of Health in Malaysia to uh, inform their primary health care policy and to reshape their primary health care policy. And we did that using the person-centered practice framework. Um, that work is still going on, actually. So I finished the development work with them three years ago. Um, and uh, they've just actually published a paper on reshaping primary health care um, and they've used the PCPI instruments to, to do that as well. Um, so that's kind of one example. In New Zealand, there's a lot of, uh, in the South Island of New Zealand, they've used our work to shape professional development programs for nursing and allied health professions. Um, in the UK, it's influenced the current NMC standards for nursing uh, here in Scotland. It's influenced quite a lot of that work. So I could go on, go on, go on, go on. Um, I guess, though, I'm a bit cynical about some of that because what I've yet to see uh, in a meaningful way is the translation of that into very obvious practice on a continuous basis. Mm -hmm. So it, it, um, it kind of enforces that thing I said earlier, that there is a, a tendency to claim person-centeredness um, at all levels of our system without the um, commitment to its continuous implementation and continuous development. Um, and I think governments are as guilty of that as organizational leaders are. Um, so we have kind of shifted our focus a little bit uh, in our work to try and really um, challenge the organization and systems level because um, we can carry on working with teams forever to help develop person-centered cultures. But unless the system, the organization buys into those same values, then we're really setting those people up to fail. And, and I'm not prepared to do that. I think it's wrong that we, we do that. So we have been got increasingly challenging to organizations actually about that and to t uh, systems about making that happen. So I've become less, um, less discreet about that is the best way I can put it, <laughs> but still holding on to my job. <laughs> That's super. Thanks. It's interesting when you talk about making the claims because Sue Bookie Bassett, uh, whose question I absolutely love, uh, asks, how do we support nursing leaders to practice person-centered leadership? Say that again, Ernie, uh, you broke up. Sorry, my love. How do we support nursing leaders to practice person-centered leadership? Yeah. Um, so... Again, it's a really great question. Um, we have two um, doctoral studies, um, one of which has been incredibly significant um, and has been uh, really powerful. And that's Sean Cardiff's work, who you know uh, from the Netherlands. Um, and his framework for person-centered leadership actually is getting a lot of traction uh, around that. So it, it challenges some of the established norms around transformational leadership and those kind of things, and really brings the values that I've been talking about into center space. Um, 
And then uh, very much taking on board uh, those principles and working in a very different way of developing those leaders, a bit like we're doing in the BOLD program. It's not a leadership course. It's actually a whole kind of unraveling of my personhood and, uh, and how do I bring out those, those qualities. Um, I've been involved in some of that work in Oslo as well, um, where, uh, which is a, a paper somewhere in the mix coming out from that, um, around with community nursing teams uh, to develop um, this kind of leadership uh, approach with community nursing teams and self-managed teams, uh, building on the Dutch Björtsorg uh, model. But, but Björtsorg is quite formulaic, I think, in lots of things that it does. And uh, what this work was about was really putting those person-centered values at the core of nursing leadership and then building that out into the community. And it, it has been quite influential in, sh in reshaping the way uh, primary healthcare services in the city of Oslo uh, are being shaped uh, currently. But it's not about leadership courses. And that's the thing I really want to emphasize. Um, I am very proud of the fact that I haven't gone on a leadership course in about 12 years. Uh, and I kind of tend to still refuse to because for this belief I have about what it is that we need as leaders in terms of bringing out our qualities. So I've engaged in endless and continuous development uh, in those 12 years that for me is the leadership development I need and I'm committed to, but without it being kind of boxed into a particular course. And I, I still am at that point in life of refusing to go on the one of these incredibly expensive leadership courses and somehow in the, on that basis, I'm going to be a, a good leader. I don't believe it for a second. That might be controversial. <laughs> no, that's, a, that's your view. And so then that, that's true for you. And I think as we look at it, even as I began this role, Sean and I had a conversation about what it means to be a person-centered leader and have designed a, a, an actually a first person research project to explore exactly what those concepts yeah mean uh, in that world and, and what we value by it. So uh, one of our PhD students, another one of them, Christina Canton, has asked, do you have any suggestions for inclusive person-centered demographic questions for surveys? Ooh. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's a, a great question again, because of course we are now in the, um, in the midst of the whole things around, you know, that have been illustrated, I think, by things like Black Lives Matter and the whole, um, I guess, racist, phobic kinds of all things that has that has uh, exposed. Um, I think um, what we have tried to do, and I don't think we do it very well, and it's something we've had more conversations about, is to try and, and stop the kind of polarization questions um, and to try and get more nuanced questions. Um, and, um, and I think that's really quite difficult, you know, that you know, the whole male, female, blah, blah, uh, kind of thing. It's to try and break through some of that. But I, I don't think we are anywhere near getting that, getting that right. I think um, what we have tried to do in some of the work we've done is to use that, quest that core question of, who, who am I as a person and different versions of that. Um, I, I think we can strip back a lot of the demographic stuff that we collect. I'm always intrigued by demographic data that's collected and what happens to it and, and the assumptions we make about it. Um, but, you know, if we, one of the work, piece of work we did in that with some doctoral students in, in Norway was around uh, in, in some of their survey work with people with mental health um, problems was to get away from asking them some of these polarized kind of dichotomous questions, but actually focusing much more on who are you as a person? What is the context in which you are, exist kind of questions? And that has actually been quite helpful, I think. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a huge amount of work still to be done on that. I think uh, Christine has identified an, an area that she can explore in her work and think about how we can achieve that as we work together. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so um, Joanne's got a, another level of a tough question for you. And Joanne comments, how do we support system leaders and politicians to understand personhood and person-centeredness? The macro level has an enormous influence on the meso and micro. Yeah, is this Joanne Bosenkett? Yes, it is. Yes, I can see her. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to see all these familiar faces too. So thank you for coming along. Um, 
yeah, again, uh, I think it's the same process. I don't think um, we should be uh, privileging the macro context in terms of the leaders that somehow they need something special. Um, I have some experience of doing this work, particularly in the Republic of Ireland, uh, where we have been working with healthcare leaders at a macro level um, to develop person-centered cultures. So it's one of the studies I've thought about um, talking about, but decided to get against it. Um, but um, essentially, we were commissioned by the Irish Health Service to develop person-centered cultures across the whole of the system in three years. Um, and um, of course, that's completely impossible. Uh, particularly if anybody knows anything about the Irish health system, you will know it's, it takes a little bit longer than three years to fix many of the problems that exist there. Um, but um, what we did focus on was this, um, what I said earlier, two things. One was the developing of facilitators across the system so that instead of uh, you know, going in and trying to change culture and then walking away, to actually work with people who would be there every day, that bringing out leaders idea. Um, and we have, over the three years we worked with, our target was 600 facilitators and we got to about 400. Um, and so now we have these 400 people who are still connected and forming a community dotted across the whole of the health system who continue to use these processes in their day-to-day -day work. And there are two uh, people who are my co-facilitators of the major program based in the Irish health system supporting them and all the rest of it. But simultaneously, we designed a program to work with the healthcare leaders, the macro leaders. Um, and uh, we kicked that off because I, they invited me to a breakfast meeting um, to talk about what we were doing, quote, to these staff. Um, and, um, and I kind of helped them to see we were doing nothing to these staff, but we were doing lots of things with them, but that everything that we were doing with them was a waste of time unless they engaged in the same processes, um, which of course is not what they were expecting given that they were directors of medicine, the chief executive of the health service, et cetera, et cetera who of course don't believe that that's for them, that's for, that's for the staff, it's not for them. And actually what resulted out of that and further conversations is that um, we designed a, a similar program that we were doing with facilitators for these healthcare leaders at that, at that level, uh, which is still happening actually, facilitated by my, by my colleagues. Um, and that's been quite revealing uh, in the sense of how it has shaped their thinking, how it has shaped some of the quality improvement work, for example, that they were doing, how it sh has shaped um, the way they are kind of educating future, future leaders and what they're thinking about, and also some of the demands they've placed on, on managers and others. Now, it's, it's a, I think it's a good example, but it needs a lot more work to further develop. But I think it needs that kind of work. Um, I don't think there's any magic bullet, um, but I don't think we should be seeing the macro leaders somehow being different from the rest of the leaders who need this very participatory engaged uh, way of working. I think we make a mistake if we, if we think that. Wonderful. Thanks, Brendan. So many different types of questions that everybody is asking. I, I love the eclecticism of it, which sort of leads to the next question, because in your presentation, you commented on methodological pluralism. And Shiri, would I like you to speak a little bit more about it and maybe give an example? Yeah, oh, suddenly think of what's the example I'd use. <laughs> so um, what we mean um, is that we, if you're going to, if you're going to take a person-centered perspective in research and um, accept, accept the idea that we are, we are multiple complex beings um, and we're not one thing, then you cannot use one thing, i.e. one methodology to research that person or those persons. Um, it actually doesn't make any sense philosophically or methodologically actually to do that. Um, you can, of course, if you're just researching right toe surgery or something, um, then maybe you, maybe you possibly can. But if you're looking at persons in society and persons in healthcare, then um, we, you, you can't do that because every time you do that, you are eroding their personhood fundamentally, which is our philosophical stance. So what we try to do um, is to take a step back from it. So our PhD candidates spend a lot of time, um, painfully at times, um, as some of them might vouch for, um, 
going through kind of a philosophical training for want of a better term to understand ontology and epistemology um, to some depth um, and before we ever allow them near methods or questions or any of that kind of stuff so they may have a question or a name uh, that sits there in the background but we absolutely kind of restrain them from going anywhere near it uh, too soon so the first best part of if they're full time the first year is spent on that work if they're part time it could be two years uh, just working with that and what we expect them to come out of it are a set of philosophical principles based on their own ontology that is who they are as a person um, and their epistemological um, knowledge um, and um, and it's and then we will play with those principles and we will um, get them to think about well okay so maybe that is predominantly hermeneutic fine but um, is hermeneutic hermeneutics enough? Do you also need to add in something uh, to, to do that? And um, it's it's very good question to ask, it's very current, because this week we had our, we have in the ICOP that I mentioned, we have also got the PSYCOP, <laughs> which are, are not alien beings, uh, but it's the uh, student version of our ICOP. So our 30 um, doctoral candidates form a community of practice, uh, which Erna, I think, has experienced uh, when she's been with us, uh, that's um, kind of facilitated through our centre. And on this week, we had um, them presenting their progression sem uh, seminars to a, a variety of people. And one of the candidates that I'm working with, uh, Lorna in Ireland, who is one of the facilitators of that programme I was mentioning, um, has been, um, her research is looking at human flourishing among palliative care practitioners uh, in the community and how those practitioners um, engage in flourishing activities and how does that impact on, on practice. And she actually has spent a lot of time uh, developing that um, framework for her research. And she's brought together some hermeneutic concepts, but more importantly, she's brought together some critical creative ideas, um, which come from critical theory, but she's also brought some realist perspectives into that. And through all of that has constructed this kind of inclusive methodology that enables uh, multiple perspectives to be taken. Um, and then from that, we develop a core set of methods. So we, we try and look at methods that will take, will keep all of those principles happening all of the time. And it's it's really exciting work and uh, very complex, but really exciting. But it, it just really is so much richer and deeper than, you know, the phenomenology of, or the grander theory of, or the ethnography of. Um, it, it kind of, adds a different richness to that kind of work and that's what's it was so exciting seeing those eight candidates present on that one day and the way they are challenging methodologies the way they are not accepting you know taking for granted assumptions underpinning these things and, and really putting themselves out there to kind of uh, take forward a whole new approach to research I think which is very exciting. Awesome that's wonderful Brendan. So we're going to leave academia for a minute and we're going to go to the hospital. And um, we've got a variety of colleagues with us today from different disciplines. Uh, Damon is an emergency medicine physician, and he struggles with his interdisciplinary colleagues with the growing normalization of hallway medicine, increased RN ratios in the OR, and decreased access to community and hospital care. And he worries that our struggles with burnout are directly related to the healthcare system breakdown. So he agrees that person-centered practice, he wrote patient, but I've changed it to person. He agrees that person-centered practice is essential and doable, but it's become so much more challenging over the last 15 years of his practice. I think the trainees see this very early on. Can you comment? Yeah, um, and I, I, I kind of feel your pain, <laughs> mainly because uh, we've had, a, again, a, some studies in emergency departments um, and the challenges there are, are enormous in relation to um, trying to retain some, some sense of, of personhood and person-centeredness for staff and for service users. Um, I think, again, I, I, I think the danger in healthcare that we have is that we often see some of these processes and ways of being relational aspects of practice as being useful and operational in particular contexts. 
So I often get the challenge that, you know, oh, well, it's easy to be person-centered in nursing home care. It's easy to be person-centered in, in palliative care. And I can tell you it's not. Um, and it's easy to be person-centered in, in those kind of areas, but it's impossible to be person-centered in a critical care unit or an emergency department. Um, and I, I completely refute those ideas because it's not about... If we say that it's just about the doing, you know, person-centered is something we tag on at the end when we've done the, the important work. But if we bring it back to our being, and there are some very simple changes that can be made in emergency departments um, to actually make it a more person-centered experience for everyone. And, but I think the same idea about how we do team development, how do we, um, you know, pay attention to the culture and the way we relate to each other and the way that we talk to and about each other uh, are fundamental starting points really to changing, changing that culture. And then if we, if we take it that we apply those same principles at the point uh, of entry of a service user, for example, when they're being triaged um, or triaged, depending on which way you pronounce it, um, one of our doctoral candidates in Ulster, for example, that was the focus of her PhD was person-centeredness in the triage relationship um, and developing that. And, and she identified very clearly that practitioners were able to be person-centered in all the ways that I've described in a five-minute engagement. Um, mm -hmm. And that it didn't need, you know, an hour and a half of a relationship for them to be able to, to do that, but it, it could happen in five, 10, 15 minutes. But they needed to be acknowledged that that was okay, you know, that actually not immediately starting with the stethoscope and examination, but starting with who are you and why you're here was as important as starting with what's wrong with you. And, um, and that's the culture we have to shift. And those subtle changes have an enormous impact uh, on the way the culture then grows and develops. But again, I will come back to it needs psychologically safe environments to be developed where people can feel okay about doing that kind of work and don't you know, get labeled as something that's odd or different, uh, but actually as becomes the norm. Um, so there's huge potential, I think. And I think in emergency departments in particular, because they are the window through which people view the rest of the health system. Um, it is so important we get person-centered principles right in that department. And yet, sadly, it's often the place where it's not for the reasons that have been, have been outlined. And there's, a, again, a massive amount of work to be done there. Thank you, Brendan. You've, you've opened up, I hope, the next levels of conversation about our challenges to questioning are we really person-centered? What does it mean to our practice and how do we actually engage in it? And I remember oh, um, several years ago when a colleague of mine in Australia invited me to help her mark papers being person-centered versus my traditional, that's not a sentence. And while you can gravitate towards the uh, middle part of that sandwich feedback of not positive, um, being person-centered is also about being more than being positive. So although there's still many more questions, there's one that I'll end with that I think is probably a, a neat way to go. And this comes from Joan, who's one of the faculty members here. She thanks you for your outstanding and uh, thought-provoking presentation and wonders, can you discuss further how you integrate or marry um, the concepts of evidence-informed and person-centeredness um, that's that paper we're doing, remember? And how the measurement of effective care, because you mentioned outcomes. So what are outcomes that are related to effective person-centered care? Great yeah. way to end off. Yeah. Um, and that's it. I just want to share a story of something that's happened very recently uh, back in the academic world. And uh, it was a, a doctoral exam that I did as an external examiner. Um, and I wrote a report and I write my reports. I try to write my reports in a very person-centered way, um, even though there might be things to be said that are critical, I still do it in a person-centered way. But actually the particular university came back to me to say, could you just strip away all of this stuff and just give us the key points the students need to address? Um, I just said no. Um, so, you know, we have this challenge all the time. So wherever you are, you get, you get, the, you get the same challenges. Um, the particular question on outcome, yeah, um, we, uh, so the healthful culture outcome is one that we have only very recently actually changed to. So that was uh, actually last year. Um, if you look at our previous publication, so from 2014 onwards, uh, we've had four outcomes in the center. 
And the reason we changed from those four to the one is actually we realized in the development of our instruments that essentially we were double counting, um, that if we um, evaluated healthful cultures, we were also capturing these four outcomes. And the four outcomes are a good care experience um, for both staff and patients. Um, so the outcomes relate to staff and patients, and that's really important that it's not just about measuring patient care, but you know, a good care experience is as important for the nurse and the doctor as it is for the patient. Um, a feeling of well-being was the second outcome. Um, I'm going to forget them now. I remember three and I'll forget the fourth as normal. Why is that happening? There's a psychology around that. Um, the um, third one was around holistic care. So that I've, you know, actually it feels like I've had more than my right toenail cut off, but I'm actually, I've been treated the whole person and I have forgotten the fourth one. Um, but I, they're published and very easy to, what is the fourth one? <laughs> very easy to access. Um, and, but the important thing about those outcomes is, yes, they take account of the more technical aspects of care, put it that way, the interventions, et cetera. Um, but they measure from the perspective of both the patient and the staff, because that is a really important principle to hang on to. If I, if I just take the, co the good care experience one to reiterate, you know, a good care experience for staff is what prevents burnout, is what prevents that moral distress, is what prevents people going on sick leave, it's what, it's what prevents people from leaving their job. It enhances retention of nurses and others. So if we don't pay attention to that, then actually it doesn't matter that the patient has had a good care experience because the staff are, are not flourishing. So we have to keep them always in balance. And so when we, from a number of our studies, um, we realized that actually we also had healthful culture as an outcome, that was one, um, that um, actually we were double counting by having healthful culture and these other outcomes that we could capture them all uh, through the one. We have just, um, there's a paper in review at the moment that we've done uh, with a sample of all of the work we've, we've done um, where we've taken all of the PCPI data and looked at the correlation between some of the constructs of the domains in our framework to see how do they connect with the outcomes. So it's our first attempt to try and see are there particular constructs, so like um, sympathetic presence comes out very highly actually, that really influences practice and influences the outcomes compared to some others, for example. And interestingly, um, values doesn't come out as strong as we might think. And that's an important thing because actually it reinforces some other work that goes on around values, that values in themselves change nothing. It's how those values are operationalized, worked with, you know, really engaged with that changes stuff. So it doesn't surprise me that in this hierarchical statistical model we're using, that actually they come out quite low on statistically, because unless you connect them with other things, they're meaningless. So there's, there's lots of really intricate and interesting stuff in there, I think. There sure is, but I, what I, one of the many things that I've learned from you is that if in order to flourish, <laughs> in order to flourish, all persons in their context matter. And those are what we've learned during this pandemic, that the person that does the cleaning in our hospital, as we now know and, and reinforced, is as equally as important as the CEO, as the nurse, as the physician, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't think for a moment that any person's goal is not to do the best to improve outcomes. I just hope as we began in our conversation today that we can continue that level of conversation to reflect on the other, who we are as a person and how we move forward. So Brendan, um, although you're gonna get to speak with Pete himself, I just, I wanna say uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us on our section, second uh, Jerry McEwen uh, lectureship. It's a pleasure to have you and uh, our company together. Uh, we've had a whole bunch of neat questions. I'll send you some more. Uh, we yeah, have please do. Time. Uh, it's dark where you are and light where we are. And um, we're, it's just the way that it goes. And maybe it, had it not been Zoom, uh, we wouldn't have had quite so many people. So there are some ble blessings that come from all of this. So thanks for joining us. We appreciate your time. And I think you'll be hearing from a lot of people. <laughs> Thank you all very much. It's been wonderful to join you. Great. All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Stay tuned for uh, things to follow and words on, on person-centered practice. And uh, I appreciate your time today. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. We'll see, see you soon, Brandon. Yeah, yeah.
Take care. Bye, everyone.